So I will talk a little bit about how you can apply automated machine learning and what it actually does and what it actually is. So hopefully this will be actually useful in practice. Um, that said, I will keep that this as a relative at a relatively high level. Um, because we are limited in terms of the the amount of time I can spend on this. That said, I'm happy to take any questions. In particular, if people are not as familiar with machine learning as I'm maybe assuming, and if anything is unclear to you, feel free to interrupt me. And I would rather have you ask questions at the beginning rather than just sitting here and being like, uh, well, I didn't understand the thing about half an hour ago. Yeah. OK. Uh, then without further ado, let's get started on this. Oh. You have to, you have to first click on the PowerPoint, the laptop. No, but it works. No, 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 it, it, it does. Okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was. No, this is. Yeah, and sorry, if you have been here on Tuesday, then you have already seen a lot of this presentation here. So that, that it might not all be, be all that interesting. OK, so what's the big picture for what we're trying to solve? Uh, if you have done any kind of machine learning or indeed any kind of AI, you will know that this is not particularly right and not particularly straightforward. And one of the reasons is because there's just so many things that you could do. In particular, if you're talking about machine learning, right? I mean, okay, do you, do you even if you decide that you absolutely want deep neural networks because that's what everybody is talking about, and like, uh, okay, what kind of deep neural? How do I train this? Uh, what hyperparameters? So this is really not straightforward to do in practice. And uh, in particular, doing the right approach, which I which I put in quotes here, because what is right really depends on the particular context is not really easy at all. And this is something where even people who have done this for a long time can be really, really wrong, as in, I think, hey, we should use this. And then it turns out that, no, actually, it doesn't work at all. So if you only take one thing away from this talk, it is that you should, should do this kind of stuff automatically. Don't try to do it manually, and don't try to simply say that, oh, well, I've used this before and this worked, so we will just do the same thing as we have always done. Here's an automated approach to figure this out. And I will give you, towards the end, I will give you some pointers on automated stuff that you can just download and just use in your particular, for your particular problem in particular, machine learning. Lars, can I have a spoiler question? Yes. Are you going to have automated choice of a model or? Automated choice of a machine learning model. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We'll have it. Oh, yes. That's, in fact, my next slide. Uh, well, OK, the, only the problem, not the solution. Solution left up as an exercise, too. <laughs> um, OK, so the point of this, really, this entire field uh, of automated machine learning is that people who don't have the background in machine learning can use really a state-of-the-art approach and really do something that works well in their particular case and not just rely on, well, I just download this off the shelf thing and it somewhat works. Uh, and like I said, this even applies for experts who have been doing this for a long time because it is really the case that depending on the particular data set that you're working with, you might want to use completely different. Approaches. So there's not necessarily just a one side fits all. Okay, so. Uh, Yes, as, as some motivation, here's a, a figure from one of our recent papers. This just gives you some idea on the kind of modeling choices that you can in a machine learning task. So here, there's this machine learning pipelines that, uh, well, really just do mostly prepos. We're not even talking about machine learning here. And as you can see, this gets already really, really complicated. Which one of these do you want to choose? I don't know. Use an automated method to figure that out for you. That's what I mean. OK, so yeah, here, Tomas, this is the, the question you were asking, right? Uh, yes. Given but not in general, parameters for a given algorithm, but. Right. So given a problem, choose the best algorithm to solve it. And this, this goes back to the first question this was asked in the, the first time this was asked in literature was in the mid 70s. So uh, yeah, we're still working on that. Um, but that is really the simplest formulation of this problem. And if you define algorithms sufficiently broadly, then this could include the parameters or hyperparameters, depending on what context you're working on of an algorithm as well. So really, that's fundamentally what we're still working on. Of course, in practice, the difficulty is that the number of possible algorithms might be extremely large or even bit, 
Uh, so we have to do this somewhat intelligently. If you look at this in the context of machine learning, then here's a slightly more formal definition of this. So we have some hyperparameter space uh, because, of course, in machine learning, we call this hyperparameters. If you're working in AI, then the same thing is called parameters, just to make it confusing. Um, but same thing. We have some kind of space big lambda, and we essentially want to find the element of this, element or elements, depending on the setup of the problem, that without loss of generality, minimize our generalization error of a model that is induced on a particular data set given this particular. So really, we want to find something that works well for the particular data set that we want. And D here could also be a set of sets. So as in, we want to find something that works well across a range of different data sets or across a range of different data set distributions and not necessarily just on one. More common case is that we're really interested in optimizing for one particular given. Uh, coming back to my question, because I did yes. probably use the, the correct wording, but you also switch between algorithms. Yes, absolutely. So, and really, this formulation here is the more general case of the previous one, because you could say that my choice of algorithm is simply another hyperparameter. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, and then, then solving this problem automatically solves the problem. And like I said, you can also a kind of equivalent formulations Absolutely. depending on how exactly you use. But that's the fundamental problem that we're interested in. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at how we actually do practice. Uh, and again, I will do this on a relatively high level here. Happy to go into more details if you have any questions on it. But in the interest of time, only, only doing this on a very general case. What we're doing in general is treat the thing that we want to optimize as a black box function. So that means that we don't know what exactly it does internally. We don't know what exactly the effect of these hyperparameters is. We just know that, well, we can change stuff and if we change stuff, things happen or maybe they don't even happen. In particular, we're not assuming that the function that we want to optimize or the algorithm that we want to optimize is differentiable or that we have gradients or that we have any kind of continuity assumptions on the optimization landscape or anything like that. And that means that all of these techniques are really very generally applicable. And while I talk about this here in the context of machine learning, you can apply the same kind of techniques in AI more generally, and people have done that, and you can apply them in engineering more generally, and you can apply them really to any other kind of problem more generally. Anything where you have a black box problem that you Yes. So I was uh, thinking about it last time, that like this auto ML for like uh, algorithm. Do we have auto ML for auto ML? Ah. Can we automate auto ML? In principle, yes. In practice, that becomes really, really hairy because each individual evaluation tends to be very, very expensive. But yes, so you can optimize this whole system for you kind of thing. And then you can add another layer on top to optimize the optimizer for the optimizer of the model. And you can continue doing that, uh, but I don't recommend that. Uh, so usually at the optimizer level, the optimizer for the machine learning model level, it stops because of various practical concepts. But in theory, yes, you can continue this as long as you like really. And that might be, uh, uh, that, that is a very interesting research question. What extent can you optimize the optimizer? Uh, I can talk about some preliminary stuff that we have done in that. Okay, so yes, we want to optimize this as a black box function, black box function. So really the only thing that we can do is modify the values of the parameters or hyperparameters and I'm using these words somewhat interchangeably here. And then we observe the effect of it. So that means that after each change, we do an evaluation of the system, whatever that entails. So in this context here, that me this means that we're inducing a model on our training data set and then evaluating that. And maybe we're doing that and to get better what generalization would, error estimates. Yes. What would, would be, what? What would constitute parameters of uh, like convolutional neural network? So this way, of the like well, 
for individual nodes or uh, yeah okay so this is this is where it gets a little bit confusing these would be the parameters and really what i mean parameter context of machine learning so this would be things like the learning rate okay or so, the optimizer that you're using or yeah. the the architecture of the neural network okay um yeah. let me continue okay and yes, that this is unfortunately somewhat confusing in particular because in different parts of the literature, depending on what you're optimizing, different names or the same names are used to mean different things. Um, yeah. Okay, I should just imagine that this is hyperparameters. Hyperparameters. So uh, yes, and essentially all that this optimization process does is decide where to evaluate. What experiment do we what thing do we want to do next that will hopefully allow us to do this optimization better? And we have the usual problem of balancing diversification or exploration and intensification or exploitation. So to what extent do we want to focus on stuff that we know works well and try to modify that in slight ways versus find something completely different? Because we don't know, but it might work really well. Uh, yes. This we essentially repeat. So this is an anytime, this is usually an anytime algorithm where we iteratively optimize the underlying black box process so we can stop this at time and inspect this at any time with respect to the quality of the result that we have got so far. Okay. Uh, yes, which brings us to the question of when do we actually stop this? Because the main problem with all of these approaches is that they are incomplete. Uh, and the, with one exception, which is not really feasible practice. So that means that we might find the global optimum, but we might not realize that we have found the global. And we cannot prove in general that we have found the global. So uh, yes, and we, we really have no guarantees at all. So the result that we get, usually what we find is pretty good, but it could be really, really bad. And yeah, that's just the nature of it. No guarantees with this thing particular quality of uh, In practice, what we do is that we usually stop this process when we have some kind of resource limit. So for example, you are starting this when you leave tonight and on Monday morning you need the because you want to work with your model. So that's when you stop the problem. That's, that's how much time with you. Or you, you got a day on your cluster and that's how long you can run this for and you can't run it for any. Uh, alternatively, you could stop this when the performance is good enough. That's always, I, I tend to not use this in practice because, well, what does good enough mean, right? I mean, accuracy 100%, okay, maybe at that point I can stop, but of course in practice, you never reach that, right? So it is always, well, you do that because you don't have a like, time limit, right? Well, if you don't have a time limit, you just run it forever. And because it's an anytime... Yeah, you know, I mean that you are in science. Right. Well, there your time limit is the conference deadline, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a time limit. Yeah, so that, that's actually the, the, the other motivation for limited resources, right? Okay, it is the date of the yeah, conference. The, conference. <laughs> yeah. the most yeah. limited resource. <laughs> yes. Uh, good. So how do we actually do this in practice? Here are two kind of baseline, simple approaches, and you might have used some of these already. So the most straightforward thing is a grid search, where you exhaustively evaluate the entire parameter space. Obvious problem with this, this is really, really expensive. So in practice, we can't really, unless we really do a much, much coarser grid than what we could actually do. If we do this with a fine enough grid, this is the only approach that actually has any guarantee. In particular, it will find the solution and it will be able to prove that this everything else has no guarantees at all. But yeah, so in practice, people really only do this for relatively small spaces uh, if they want to compare their new automated machine learning approach and show that it gets within some percentage of the total optimal solution empirically or something. Yeah. Hi, right, right. This is famous guy. This... Yoshua Bengio? Yes. Yes. Oh, he got a, a cheering award. So, yeah. No, uh, he he's written a number of papers in this area. Not, well, well, yeah, no, more or less directly related to all of 
Because of course, for TPL networks, this is really quite important, right? In particular, doing this efficiently. Uh, but yeah, this was one of the the earlier works. So like, uh, yeah, eleven ish years ago, a little bit more than eleven years ago now, on uh, essentially comparing discrete search and random search, uh, which at that time was one of the state of the art approaches. It's still something that is at least going to give you a reasonable baseline to compare to. So other approach, random. You do this completely randomly. You just sample from your parameter space, and then you run these. The advantage is that this is really easy to implement, and you can also really easily parallelize. You just, you know, you take a thousand samples, and then you send it off to a thousand machines, or 10,000, or 100,000. You can scale this very easily. And you can also choose how many resources you want to spend, right? Because you control the number of samples. And in particular, if you have a coarse grid, which is essentially what's shown here, it's te this tends to be more effective than a grid search in practice because in this case here, we have one parameter that simply doesn't do anything. It's unimportant. Then we have the other one that actually changes stuff. If we sample along a grid, then essentially all the, like the, the columns here give us one data point because that's really up here where things change. On this axis, they don't give us any useful input, but we're still paying for those evaluations. If we do it randomly, we get a little bit more information just before, because we fall in between the kind of grid points that we have here. So another thing that uh, you should take away from this is that random usually works really, really well in practice, and it's really, really easy. So even if you don't want to use any of the more sophisticated approaches, or you can't for whatever reason, then just you know write three lines of code to randomly sample from your space. And that will already usually give you quite competitive. Were different yes. approaches to the randomness tested as well? Oh, yes. Uh, so not really in this paper, if I remember correctly, but this this was 11 years ago. So this is kind of, you know, going back to the... Great like, times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was in... I mean, this was almost in computer science terms. This was kind of carved into stone. Nice. Right, the equivalent. Um, but yeah, so uh, I just like this illustration because it makes it intuitive why in practice you really don't want to use it. And if you've never done this before, you might think that, oh, grids are not such a bad I use a coarse enough grid and then do my evaluation. Um, um, yes, and so just as a side note, usually in practice we find exactly this thing, that you have your different parameters, and some of these don't matter at all. They don't affect performance. That might be only for that particular problem, or that might be a more general thing, but they don't affect performance at all. And then you really don't want to waste resources by search. OK, let's talk about something that is more intelligent. Uh, Model-based optimization, this is also called Bayesian optimization. So for all of the stuff that I'm talking about, unfortunately, there's different names in the literature depending on what paper you're reading or what area of the literature you're having a look at, which can get a little bit confusing. And as I mentioned, in some cases, there's also the same term used for different things. So uh, yeah, welcome academia. In model-based or Bayesian optimization, what we tend to do is that we start with a small number of initial configurations, and these could be chosen at random, for example, or you could do like a lap hypercube, whatever really you want to start with. Then we use machine learning to build a so-called surrogate model. So this is something that learns to relate the input uh, parameter settings or hyperparameter settings to the output, the performance that we observe. So for example, our generalization estimate. And then we optimize on this surrogate model instead of on the expensive underlying process. So the assumption here is that whatever the process is that we want to optimize is relatively expensive compared to the surrogate. So it's not something that you can compute like this, but something that will take at least a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes. Or if we're talking about AI problems, it could be hours and days and weeks. Uh, but point being, it's relatively expensive. So then you use the model to decide where to evaluate next. We'll go through an example in the slide. So don't worry, this will hopefully make more sense in just a little bit. And repeat this whole process. 
So these steps here. And we stop when, again, we have either exhausted the resources or we have reached a level of solution quality that we're happy with. In contrast to, in particular, the random sampling that we talked about before, this allows for a very targeted exploration, exploit, exploitation, really, of the things that work well and the targeted search through the space. If we find something that works, that's what we can concentrate on going forward. If you think about that, this, this is really intuitively at a high level, very similar to what you would do as a human if you were to do it. You try a bunch of things, and you find that, oh, this works. So you have your mental surrogate model of the underlying process, right? Then you focus on that. Then you have satisfied yourself that, oh, there's nothing better there. Then you go somewhere else where you don't really have the knowledge and continue this entire process. Except, of course, that when the machine does it, it doesn't get confused after about but for me, this would be like, you know, 10 evaluations or something. I'm like, uh, hang on, what did I do here? How does all of this fit together? And it doesn't get, doesn't get frustrated if you let this run uh, overnight or for a week. Okay, so let's have a look at a, uh, first of all, at a picture summarizing this whole process, hopefully making this a little bit more understandable. Here's our process that we want to evaluate. Black box know the gears. We, we don't know anything about the gear. It's a black box. Something that is expensive to evaluate. In particular, it's not feasible to simply try all different all kinds of different settings and then optimize over that. We need to do this more intel. We need to intelligently decide what evaluation we're going to do. Because this might be training a deep neural network on 100 A100 GP for a week. That, so really not something that you can we observe the output given particular parameter settings. When we update our surrogate model and we use that with to the side vector, we simply repeat this whole process. The only thing that the user has to provide is the parameters and the way of evaluating them. Then we can interrupt this at any point. We interrupt it, but we can get at any point the current incumbent in terms of the parameter settings that will give us the best thing so far, and we can run with that. And this can also be useful if you have essentially a long running process that is solving many types of problems. So you're building a lot of machine learning models, which are all based on data from the same distribution, for example, because you're, you're getting more user data and every time you want to read the model, you can keep this running in the background. Every time you find a, different, a better hyperparameter setting, you simply apply that to very nicely with uh, these kinds of questions. Question? Yes. Um, Eddie, we had already discussed it, but like, uh, if you have, uh, we are like uh, looking for one algorithm, but some kind of generation algorithm. Yeah. But is it possible that we run it for like three or four different optimization algorithms? Like same time and choose which one is the better. Yeah, then. absolutely. So then that would be one of your parameters, right? So then that, that wouldn't be a numeric parameter, it would be a categorical parameter. And that makes things a little bit more difficult. Well, it, not even, it really just makes them different in practice because that affects what type of surrogate model you want to use and a kind of a bunch of other technical things. But in principle, yes, absolutely. And this is uh, how. Really, all of these automated machine learning systems, we'll give you some pointers in a bit, work in practice. That they don't only optimize the hyperparameters for the support vector machine, but they also decide on this particular data set, do I want to use the support vector machine or do I want to use Final Forest or XGBoost or a deep neural network or anything along those lines. And these are categorical choices. You actually have the same if you only consider a single machine learning algorithm in many cases. So for example, support vector machine, you have a choice of kernel. That's a categorical parameter, right? There's no, there's no relationship between different kernels in the, sense, in the same sense as a, a numeric range here. So you could also, but all of that fits exactly in the same way. Just some, just some technical consideration you have to take. Hello. <clears throat> uh, I have a question. This is Matt. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, uh, thank you for this good good presentation. It's going very well. Uh, I have come across a question. 
about uh, uh, finding the best config parameters. For example, yes. the parameter space is for parameter one five to one hundred or something else. Yeah. Um, for example, in a, a convolutional uh, neural network modeling, how we can choose the best parameter, or is there any tool to choose the best parameter for this training to avoid from overfitting or something else? Do you have some suggestion to add some quote here? Yeah, so I will get to that at the end. I will have some pointers to tools that you can use, including for deep neural networks. Uh, and just on the overfitting question, that essentially depends on how you define this bit here. Uh, so this is more or less up to the user. There's nothing in this framework here that will automatically detect overfitting and avoid this. But essentially, you would have to set up your evaluation here in a way that allows you to avoid overfitting. Hmm. And that for that you use the you use the 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 the, the usual methods of, for example, a cross validation, so that you don't just train a single model, and you, in particular you evaluate on a set that is different to your training. Set. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Any more questions at this point? Okay. So let's have a look at an example. Uh, so. I have in the top panel here a toy function that I want to optimize. So this is the black line, uh, this kind of quadratic function overlaid with a sign or something like this. This is unknown to the optimizer. And in general, when we want to do that, we don't know this underlying part. So just shown here for the sake of explaining this better and obviously a toy function, right? So just one parameter x here. And essentially what we want to do is identify that zero gives us the minimum uh, the, the minimum value here is what we want to minimize this function. Then we have a bunch of initially evaluated points. So these are the red circles here. And we have our initial surrogate model, which does not yet take these evaluated points into account. So this is simply the straight dashed line here. Uh, and this, this is essentially our prior where we have no information and we assume that across this entire parameter space, the value is going that is. The vaciated area is the uncertainty of these predictions. And this is also uniform for our very simple prior here. Uh, and it is also quite large because, well, we haven't seen any actual data yet. In principle, you can use different priors. You don't have to start with a uniform, completely uninformed prior. If you have some information on what works well and what doesn't work well, then you can encode that into this process. So then, Based on this completely uninformed uniform prior, our first evaluated point, the blue triangle here, is going to be chosen completely. OK, so not very interesting so far. Then in the first iteration of our optimization process, we now see that we have fit our surrogate model, the black dashed line here, to the data that we have observed also see that at the points where we have done evaluations where we know the ground truth, our uncertainty has collapsed to zero as we expect that. And the further we get away from the larger our uncertainty. As you can see, our initial surrogate model is really not very good. In particular, it completely misses the part that we're interested in. This is perfectly fine because we're going to iteratively improve. It. OK, bottom panel here, we have what's called the acquisition function. Uh, so in this case here, the surrogate model that we're using is a Gaussian process, and the acquisition function is improvement. Well, here with this, then this is these are kind of the standard choices for equation optimization. But in principle, you can mix and match those arbitrarily. So if you wanted to use a simple linear model as your surrogate model here, you can also absolutely do that. Of course, subject to the constraints of the parameter space that you're modeling, in particular with respect to any uh, non continued briefly mentioned before. OK, so what's happening now? We have the next proposed point, again, the blue triangle. And as you can see, this is close to the best point that we have found so far. Then again, conceptually, this is very similar to what you would do as a human, right? You have done a bunch of evaluations. You found that this works pretty well. This is the best thing that I found so far. So let's try something that is similar. That is, in this general neighborhood, a small change to the parameter value here. Of course, in general, this works in n dimension, right? So that's not 
easily draw in dimensions on a slide here. And this also coincides with the maximum value for our acquisition, acquisition factor. So at this point that we propose for the next evaluation, we expect to see the largest improvement over what we have found so far, over this point, best point. And this in particular takes not only the predicted value, which is actually slightly worse, but also the uncertainty. Okay, does that make sense so far? So then we simply repeat that process, we evaluate this point here, we update our surrogate model, which is not really much of an update because, well, it was kind of very correct in uh, that particular area as well. And then we again find the point that maximizes the acquisition. So this now is on the other side. Again, conceptually very similar. You know, find something good, you try to change it in one direction. Oh, that didn't work. That's actually worse. Let's try the other direction. Exactly. That thing. Okay, uh, now something slightly more interesting is happening because the model is now quite confident that there's nothing better than the red point in this particular area of our parameters. So we have uh, reduced our uncertainty so much there that the model just doesn't think that big. So now instead it goes into essentially exploration mode and goes to an area of the parameter space where it does not think that there's going to be anything good, but the uncertainty is quite high. So we don't know. Don't think that there's anything good, but there might be. I'm not certain. And so again, coincides with the maximum of our, our acquisition function here. And of course, here we got really lucky because we are really, really close to the actual global. Of course, our optimization approach doesn't know about. We update our surrogate model accordingly, and now you can see that this is much, much better for uh, And then essentially the same thing. Again, we have found a new incumbent, something that is much better than this point here in an area where there was high uncertainty. So let's look around and let's go in this direction, evaluate this. And OK, that was about the same. Let's go in the middle there. Oh, that was actually better. And look in that, continue to look in that neighborhood. Oh, yeah. OK, go back there. OK, one more. There we go. Until eventually the model is again has reduced its uncertainty here. So the model does not think that this is really an area where we can improve a lot. So instead, it goes to an area where it doesn't think that there's anything better, but the uncertainty is high. And of course, if we were to evaluate this, then we said, well, this is actually much, much worse than the model thought, and nothing good is there. At that point, we'll probably go in the other direction. Okay, does that make sense so far? So really, again, conceptually very similar to what you would do as a human. In particular, we're automatically doing this exploration and exploitation. Right? So this, this is handled here through the acquisition function, through the uncertainty of our predictions, where we're automatically training off the predicted value and the uncertainty of that predicted value, such that eventually we're going to go, we're going to, in particular, escape local optima. Right? So we're not getting stuck here. We're not even getting stuck here in what is the global optimum, but we are going to other areas of our parameter space as well. So, and as I said, this, of course, not only works in the case of one dimensions, but really in for an arbitrary number of. It's acquisition function. I'm sorry? Acquisition function. Yeah, so in the special case of a Gaussian process uh, as a surrogate model and expected improvement as your acquisition function actually analytically solve, find the maximum here. And you can also efficiently update this. In practice, the way this is often implemented is really much, much simpler. When you get a new data point, you don't update the model, you just retrain it again. And you maximize your acquisition function by searching over the parameter space in a more intelligent fashion than doing this exhaustively, but you're still searching, you're not doing this analytically. And the reason for this is that this gives you a lot more flexibility, combining different kinds of acquisition functions and surrogate models. And in some cases, some surrogate models work well, work better than others, so there is some value to this. And of course, it's much, much easier to implement in practice. It also tends to work well because remember, we're assuming that 
This process here, the search process, and this overhead of maintaining, updating, and searching over our surrogate model is very cheap compared to the underlying black box function. So even if this takes a couple of seconds, if what we're doing is optimizing a deep neural network and one evaluation takes a week, I can live with that, right? Uh, of course, there might be cases where this does actually become an issue, but in those cases where your evaluations are relatively cheap compared to this stuff here, you probably don't want to use Bayesian optimization at all. But for example, random sampling, because that obviously has no overhead or uh, something that is not model-based, like for example, genetic. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, so one more point I want to mention here, because the surrogate model is a somewhat different beast to your normal machine learning model. In particular, we're not really interested in getting good accuracy or good predictive quality over the entire space here. We're really only interested in very specific areas. Here, we're interested in this area. What happens over here, don't really care. We know that it's bad, and that's really the only thing we need to know. Same thing over here. So if you have a look at your surrogate model in terms of evaluating a normal machine learning model, you might find that is actually really bad. But that might be perfectly fine for the purpose at uh, We're also not so much interested in the absolute prediction. We're really only interested in the rank of the predictions relative to each other. The best things should still be the best, even if the actual prediction is off by an order of magnitude. Right? And this is why, this is one of the reasons why this tends to work well in practice, because even if the optimization landscape is really, really difficult to model, we can get good performance because we don't actually need another predict. So just let me uh, summarize that yeah. we need surrogate model to just like know where to look for the next step right. to evaluate, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And these like gray areas are the places that are like uh, more probable to like look that. No. So the, the gray area here quantifies the uncertainty of the predict. So here ah, okay. we have, in particular, the mean of the, so for, for here, the Gaussian process, uh -huh. the dashed line is the mean and the ends of the, well, the, this area here is a standard deviation. Okay. And what exactly that represents depends on the particular type of surrogate model that you're using. But in general, we want to have some measure of uncertainty of the prediction. So some kind of confidence in the ball, or there's different names in the literature. Okay, thanks. And this is simply so that we can automatically balance this exploration and exploitation. Mm -hmm. Like in this case here, we know that this is pretty good. Our predictions are pretty good, but our confidence is very, very high. As in, we are unlikely to actually find something better there. Whereas over here, prediction is bad, but confidence interval very large. So it could be something better. There's a, there's a reasonably high probability that it might be something better than what I'm predicting, as opposed to here, where really it's going to be exactly what I mean. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's a lot more to this in practice. Uh, so here are just some of the things that make this more challenging in practice. Um, if we're talking about things like neural architecture search, so you have your deep neural network, but Instead of simply tuning things like the learning rate or the optimizer that you're using, you also want to decide on, well, how many layers are there? What's the connectivity going to be? Or you could do this down to the individual neuron level. Or you have a machine learning pipeline, like the ones I showed you at the beginning, then we have a normally unbounded search. Right? We can always add another layer. We can always add another component to our machine learning pipeline. Of course, in practice, this only makes sense up to a certain point, right? Uh, if you have like a machine learning pipeline with a million components, then probably adding a million and one first component won't make that much of a difference. But in principle, we can do this. And this just fundamentally changes the problem because now we don't have a set number of parameters. So it's not just that an individual parameter might have an infinite number of values because it's a parameter, but we also have a potentially infinite number of parameters. So we can make this more difficult practice. And th this, is, this is still kind of where in practice you can do it, but it gets really, really expensive and it doesn't yet work as well as if you're simply doing hyperparameter optimization for, for example, a, a random forest, or even doing that over a set number of models. You can do multi-objective optimization. 
maybe you're not just interested in, for example, accuracy. Learning case. Also want something that you can train relatively quickly or maybe something that doesn't use a lot of memory at inference time because you want to run this on some kind of embedded system. Uh, you can do multi-fidelity optimization, in particular relevant for deep neural networks. The idea here is that you don't do every evaluation on the full thing, but you do a lower fidelity approximation that gives you an approximate answer, but much more quickly. And that might, for example, be that you don't train your deep neural network until it has converged, but only for 10 epochs. Or you train it on a subset of the data. Or you even only take a subset of the deep neural network that you think is hopefully predictive of how the entire thing will behave, and you evaluate on that. And then you can build these hierarchies of different levels of uh, evaluation fidelity and uh, speed up this entire process by essentially making sure that you are spending the resources on the evaluations that matter, and you don't spend a week evaluating, uh, training a deep neural network that you then find is not really competitive at all. Uh, yes, and as the question online was kind of challenges always in practice to get good generalization error estimates. If you do this, this kind of tuning where you're, you're putting an optimizer on top of your machine learning model, turns out that you also need another layer of evaluation. So now we're not talking about a cost validation, but we're talking about a nested cost validation. And that uh, you obviously have a, a combinatorial explosion of the number of evaluations too. So this becomes quite expensive practice as well. And then also what we observe in some of these cases, at least when we apply automated machine learning is some kind of meta overfitting where the hyperparameter setting that you find is specific to the data set and doesn't generalize well to even other data drawn from the same. So in practice, this tends to get uh, quite hairy. Now, the good news is that there's a bunch of resources and tools that you can use that implement best practices where you don't have to worry about all of them. So first of all, if you're not familiar with it, OpenML, this is not really an automated machine learning tool, but it's a repository for lots of data sets and the results of evaluations of algorithms on those data sets. This is kind of the raw data that's used in a bunch of different automated. And this can be a really valuable resource if you're like, well, I, I want to do something on this particular data set. What has worked well? Just go online and you can. Uh, if you're using sklearn, auto sklearn. There's a drop-in replacement for any classifier or aggressor that you use, but it does automated machine learning, including model selection under the hood. So you really just change part of a line, and then instead of waiting for a couple of seconds, you wait a couple of minutes or however long you give it, however long until you have until the conference deadline. Uh, and it does all of this optimization under the hood uh, for you. And it, it is much, much more sophisticated. It returns a whole bunch of things that make it work well in, work well in practice. So if you're using scikit-learn, use AutoSQL. Really extremely easy to use, and it will probably give you much better. For deep learning, uh, similar, there is Auto PyTorch, uh, which sits, as the name suggests, on top of PyTorch and does not only hyperparameter tuning, but also neural architecture search. And there's a bunch of different as well. So what I should also mention is that this field moves extremely quickly. So uh, yeah, you could argue that at least some of these things are not even state of the art anymore, and they might be no longer maintained. Already something new in that area. So extremely fast moving. Bunch of commercial offerings. So lots of companies doing this and also providing this as a service. So for example, Amazon, H2O, Google has something. I think Microsoft, I didn't put the Microsoft thing on here. Microsoft has something as well. Uh, so for uh, in particular, any of the big cloud providers that allow you to do machine learning -y things, they probably have some auto L tools that you can, and obviously they're going to be using it internally as well. Uh, okay, here's a little bit of further reading. First paper here is the seminal paper that introduced Bayesian optimization for uh, in, in this context and for this purpose, it was called efficient global optimization. So terminology is slightly different. There's a, a 
This is from 98, so a bit old by now, but this is this explains the fundamental method very, very nicely and also goes into a little bit of detail on if you're using expected improvement with the Gaussian process, this is how you can efficiently optimize the acquisition function. So if you're interested in that, that's a great paper to have a look at. The first, like the first paper of that list. So, well, th th this gets a little bit murky because lots of people have been doing this in different areas. In particular, Bayesian optimized variants of this have really been used for forever and ever in engineering, right? Because you don't want to build the plane or the car and then find out that, oh, it doesn't work. You want to have some kind of model. And of course, th this is not necessarily a machine learning model, but this general methodology has really been around for well, millennia, really. So this is the seminal paper that did this in a computational context with machine learning. But, uh, sorry? Well, you know, I mean, even if you go back thousands of years, people just didn't build things. They thought about, okay, how do I build this thing? How do I build it in a way that it works? Not using machine learning, but natural well, intelligence. <laughs> Uh, yes, but th this is the seminal paper that introduced this particular approach in this context. Uh, yes. I wanted to look for something of general adverse in particular, terms also like auto machine learning, or is there some more specific? Neural architecture search. Ah, okay. So and th th this is going to be a challenge because there was a paper, I think earlier this year, uh, from a very well-resourced group that summarize the findings from a thousand papers on neural architecture search from the last three-ish years. So if you want to keep up with the literature, you can't because there's basically a paper coming out. Every this is a challenging and very fast moving. Uh, right, so then in general on hyperparameter optimization, here's a kind of survey best practices paper that uh, was published relatively recently. Uh, and here is one of the many papers that compare a bunch of these different auto For neural architecture search, that, that's a whole separate story again. You can find really tons and tons of papers is on that. Uh, architecture search, uh, like focused on architecture and right. parameters only, because this is one part of this uh, automated machine. Yes, but then you would also ideally want to optimize your hyperparameters because if you find one architecture, if, if you compare an, an architecture with unoptimized hyperparameters to an architecture with optimized hyperparameters, it's obviously not a fair. So, and in general, if you're only, well, only equals interested in the hyperparameter optimization part of that, have a look at the hyperparameter optimization literature because the neural architecture search literature will be focused on specifically finding the architecture and that that gets yeah that like I said there's a ton of stuff out there. Looking at it from our practical point of view where I have some network that I want to test with someone I have. Yeah. I don't want to like go into a whole family of networks, but I want to that from that I I do. So it, uh, so as in, are you considering small changes to your network at least, like adding another layer or dropping a layer or something like this, or is your architecture fixed? I would say I have fixed thing and I just have some parameters that I know. Okay. Control the regularization. Sure. So then you can just use, for example, the optimization. Uh, yes, okay, uh, here's another one. Automated machine learning, there's a book uh, that we wrote a couple of years ago. You can find this for free online. If you absolutely insist on it, you can buy a hard copy from Springer for a, a large amount of money, I assume. Uh, but you can find exactly the same content online. Uh, so really, unless you really like having something. Uh, similarly, if you're doing this in R, first of all, thank you. Uh, but then there is this book that we are about to send to the publisher on doing machine learning and also to some extent hyperparameter. In In uh, R, you can again find this for free online and even once the printed version is available, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get this. And one of our co-authors is actually at the University of Warsaw. So, uh, so yeah, some 
some local connection there as well. And this is very much a, a work in progress, unlike the previous one, which was kind of, you know, we published it and done. But this lives online and uh, this will be updated going forward. And we really, I don't remember exactly when we started this. We started this for like a previous version of the software, something like go or something. So this has evolved over uh, the, the time as well. But uh, yeah, perhaps most interestingly in the context of automated machine chapters on parameter optimization, and there are chapters on machine learning pipelines and how to optimize. So again, really only relevant if you're doing this in R, uh, if you're doing this in Python. Sorry, not really, but I work on most of the time. Okay, so yes, time to wrap up here. So let me kind of now zoom out and give you the very big picture here. Why are we working on all of this? Eventually, where we want to go is automatically generating AI approach. Here is a figure from a paper that we wrote many years ago when we tried to do something much more ambitious than what I talked about now and essentially found that, oh, well, we can't quite do it. So here we wanted to automatically generate solvers for hard AI problems, really as in generate the code that is filed and run. And here's the architecture that doesn't, sorry, use chat. Back then we didn't have chat TBT. And no, I, I think for something like this, would be interesting to have a look at what it can do, but no, it's it's not it's not going to work. Okay, you try this. Um, but eventually, where we want to go with this is not simply choosing from a set and predefined number of alternatives, but really generating something so along the lines of where neural architecture search and um, machine pipeline optimization, machine learning pipeline optimization are already going, but doing this in a much more general fashion for really general code. So in C++, for example, and here uh, for solving particular types of it. Uh, yes, automated AI, so that the humans can focus on the creative task and let the AI fill in the details. And the way I like to think about this is kind of like a compiler, where if you go back 40 or 50 years, people did stuff manually that we now look back on, we're like, wow, that was tedious. Why on earth did you do it like that? But now we just write in a higher level language and then compile it or don't even compile it anymore and run it in an interpreted fashion. I think that what we're doing now in machine learning is essentially at that level, right? At, at that level where we, we wrote manually wrote code that wasn't compiled, that wasn't used many decades ago. And in hopefully not as many decades, but sometime soon, we will do machine learning and AI in the same way where we specify problems in a much higher level language, higher level way. And then we have automated systems like the automated machine learning systems that automatically compile or optimize this into something that we can actually run. And we will look back at what we did today and we're like, why on earth did we do it like that? That was so tedious, wasn't it? Much better now. It will be like, uh, we will ask like, Normally we have to check it. So we can ask the system that okay. So it, I need this, this, and this. It, it will model and will create it. it. It will kind of be like that. Yeah. Uh, but but it will hopefully be more intelligent than chat TV. <laughs> yeah, I know, of course. But I'm like for what do you mean? But also, so in particular, the main difference to uh, something like chat GPT is that it's not going to be a general thing. It will be specific for solving machine learning problems or it will be specific for solving mixed integer programming problems or something. And machine because it's not going to be... Yeah, sorry? But machine learning programs are general. Well, well uh, okay. certain space of problems that you cannot solve, like you can prove that you cannot solve them. Uh, and, okay, I mean, if you if you're now talking about generating code uh, in a language that is Turing complete, then you could argue that this is actually a, a general thing. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't mean, I don't mean specialized and not general in the sense of solving problems, but in the sense of if you're writing Python code, that's a very different thing to writing C++. And a good Python programmer is not necessarily a good C++ programmer, right? So that's, that's what I mean in terms of generalization versus specialization. And that ChatGPT can write C++ code and Python code and a whole bunch of other languages 
but it's not necessarily specialized to writing best possible, as I'm sure you found if you ever had it generate anything. It's more like creating a model than creating a code. Uh, no, it, it's really being able to do something in a very specialized context. Okay, uh, right, and that was the last slide that I had. So I'm happy to take any more question, acknowledge some of my funding. I was thinking about coming to Wyoming. This is in the mountains. Uh, That's 45 what? minutes. Most backyards. <laughs> most Not empty, quite. Most empty state in the US, so I've heard. That is correct, yes. We have the lowest population density. But we have uh, in the, the area is about the size of the UK, and we have just around half a million people there. What's the biggest city? Cody, I believe? The biggest city is Casper, I think, which is right in the center of the state. But there's no reason to visit Casper. <laughs> don't, don't tell them. Do you have a horse? I don't have a horse. <laughs> so can you have a horse? Yes, you can have a horse if you want. You can probably even have a gun. Oh, yes, you can definitely have it. You can have as many guns as you like. There is probably a few counties, probably a few counties where you can commit murder and you will never be prosecuted because there's not enough people to form a jury. Especially if you murder a couple of them. Yes, no, I don't I don't recommend that. But yes, you can just buy guns and there's no checks or anything. And you can just, you know, Leave them around, lying around the house. Again, not recommend, but in principle, you can do all of these things. Yeah. Because Second Amendment. Good. Any non-gun related questions? <laughs> so, approach is um, it's useful for like um, evaluate, like finding the best working models, but mm -hmm. still evaluate model uh, you have to train it yes and this part is often like very very expensive yes so, so and and this is where the multi-fidelity approach is where you're essentially saying that instead of training the full model i'm going to train this on a subset of the data or only for a small number of iterations uh, and how exactly you set this up would depend on what your type of model is and what particular context you're dealing really with does because if you I mean, the gradients can, like after only a couple interactions, the gradient can still not catch up. And the yes. perceived performance would be bad, but the actual performance after like five is very good. Yes, absolutely. So this is, of course, there are problems with this in practice. However, remember what we said earlier, we're not so much interested in the absolute performance relative. That is correct. So if we try two different things, and one is obviously worse than the other, it doesn't really matter whether it's a good approximation of the final performance or not. And this is what usually saves us in practice. But yes, you do have to be careful with that. That is true, but I mean, still, yes, mm -hmm. we can do this um, relative performance. Yes. But still, if we would measure it further, uh, the relative performance would like, be. I mean, it's like a, it's a shallow, shallow search. So of these um, possible hyperparameter space. Yes, but and you're absolutely right. So this is definitely not something where you, you can just run something and hope that it works kind of thing in practice. But usually what we find is that if something is much worse than other stuff, this will become clear pretty early. And a lot of approaches that exist for this, and one example is the hyperband algorithm, do essentially an, an iterative approach where you run a bunch of different things for at a low fidelity level. So for example, for a, a small number of epochs, and you only eliminate the part that is obviously much worse. And then you take the stuff that is kind of reasonable and you run that for a little bit longer. And you gather more and more information and use that to eliminate more and more things. Is that guaranteed to work? No. Same kind of thing as all of this stuff in general, right? You have no guarantees whatsoever. Highly possible that you're going to roll out something that would be much, much better later on, early on. But yeah. Yeah, I'm still relatively first learning, and I was wondering why I was training a lot of um, networks. Yeah. I was thinking about something like 
um, searching this space during the training. Like, uh, for example, for a learning rate, I found that there are some papers that have this moving learning rate across the epochs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the yes. during the training. And there's there's also some approaches that predict the learning curve from your initial samples and then use that information to essentially rule out stuff that is not going to be promising. So that, again, yeah, so it's a fast moving field. And there's a bunch of interesting because as a <laughs> student, I don't really have that much computational power. So uh, like evaluating a model yeah. and then using the Bayesian approach, like uh, yeah. models performance, it's it's much. Yeah. So yeah. there's a, uh, there there's a have to do this. there's a there's a Python package that is now actually deprecated after only a couple of months. Yeah. Um, this kind of tells you how fast the field is moving. Called HP Banster, which is based on an algorithm for doing multipedality optimization called Hyperband, but also but combines that with Bayesian optimization. So that would be something to have a look at. I don't know exactly what the replacement is. I think you, they actually found that it doesn't work that well in practice. What the reality is it? HP Bandster. Bandster. So band as in a band, and then stir, S-T-E-R. And this will be, if you have a look at uh, this paper here, there will be some more information on multi-fidelity optimization. Uh, will you share this presentation? It's already on your, it's recorded, right? And the file is on here. So I'm, I'm happy for you guys to do whatever you want. And the large mm -hmm. is kind of open. Operate. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I, I should mention that in particular with respect to computer, we actually have a lot of computer. And, I have uh, some external collaborators who are essentially external collaborators for mainly this purpose that they can use our computation resources. So I'm also very happy to set up an account. Then, of course, depending on what data you're working with, be a little bit careful because you will be transferring this out of the union. So if there's anything related with users or anything like that, then maybe stay away from this. Certainly, that's for the EPS. That uh, depends on where the cats are based. Are these European cats? Guns. Oh, guns. I remember like five years ago uh, in the States, people down because of the GDPR. Yeah. And they said that there's this new thing in Europe and it totally limits our capability. Yeah. And how do we? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. All, pretty much all of what it does does not allow humans in a computer science. So I'm very happy to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, so I, I haven't had it. And uh, can I ask again, to what extent do you cooperate with Microsoft? So, so oh, the, the last thing here, I don't really collaborate with them. They gave me some money to. I see. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, nice. I, which I, is I, the best kind of collaboration. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that they have this model that they work with something such as Well, in this particular way, that sometimes they just give files, but sometimes. Yeah, so I, I think I, I'm not entirely sure about Microsoft, but Amazon certainly has a large automated machine learning mm -hmm. group, uh, actually several automated machine learning working right. on. Oh, by the way, I should have put this on the slide somewhere. If you're interested in this, the second conference on automated machine learning will run in September in uh, Potsdam near Berlin, so relatively close to here. And this, the, the first time it ran last year, very nice conference, very small, not like ICML or NeurIPS or it's going to be 10,000 best friends, but it was about 150 people. So you can actually talk to people and you can actually have conversations about processes. Yeah. Highly recommend it if you're interested. Don't know what the registration fee. I think it's also relatively modest compared to some of you. You can find out more information about this at, uh, I think it's automail.cc, if I remember correctly. Or if you search for automail conference, you'll. Yeah, all else. 
And this is this is funded by at least Amazon. So Amazon is a big sponsor for this. I think Microsoft as well. At least last year there were maybe about a dozen people from Amazon. Uh, of course, they, they don't really tell you exactly what they do. They gave some present, some some idea what they doing. Yes. It's the one that I don't know if I have a presentation. Mostly, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, you discuss how it works and what has with its scope. What are like basic two or three research questions that are in auto ML uh, field that are like oh. hot topic? Well, uh, lots. I mean, uh, for example, this this whole multi-fidelity evaluation, that's an active research area. Uh, doing this better for new architecture search in particular, that's an active research area. Of course, related to multi-fidelity, because you don't want to evaluate your entire network. Like I said, there was this paper recently on insights from a thousand papers on neural architecture search from the last three or four years or something. So extremely fast moving features. Uh, also doing this for machine learning pipelines. So really anything that goes away more or less standard, I have a set set of hyperparameters uh, that I want to optimize over, but I have some kind of open space that I want to uh, evaluate over. Uh, so then there's kind of not really, I'm not aware of any active ongoing work, but this is something that I'm very interested in getting better optimization of estimates through differential privacy. So there was a, like 10 or so years ago, there was this algorithm called Threshold Out by Cynthia Dork and a couple of other people that essentially puts a differentially private proxy in front of a data set, and then you can sample and sample and sample from it, an unlimited amount of data. The problem with this algorithm is that it does not work in practice. Uh, so I've spent months on this as a postdoc trying to make this work, and it simply does not work in practice. But potentially, this would be especially interesting in this context of automated machine learning because we need a lot of data. We have this problem of having to have nested levels of evaluation, and then your very large initial amount of data becomes much, much smaller as nesting, right? So having a, something, having a way that allows you to draw an infinite amount of data would be extremely useful to avoid meta overfitting and stuff like this. Uh, so that was about three depth. Yeah. There's, a ton of stuff going on in uh, this particular. Lots of stuff happening. All right, any more questions? So I think uh, we can take it offline. Okay. Well, thanks oh. a lot. For thanks, everybody. Talk. It's very interesting. I got to say, now that you got the, the, the highest number of questions ever. <laughs> so that either means that people are interested or I was really unclear. No, no, no. It means that they are interested. But if you're unclear, okay. they probably leave the room and pretend that they know everything. Right. I guess, yeah, it, it's a Friday afternoon, right? So uh, uh, thanks for giving me. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and I, I am I'm going to stick around for a bit. So I'm happy to take more questions. Uh, then there's also somewhere, yeah. Here's my email address. So if you think of something tomorrow or Monday or, or next month or something like that, feel free to shoot me an email. Well, just talk to me and I will contact you. Yes. 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 Don't worry. I will go to you. All right. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So